Okay. You, you may start now. And you got everybody that's signed up here? So far, yes. So far, yep. Okay, Dick was on and he just dis oh there he is again. There he's back. Okay, and so is Robert Stowers, so we're we should be good. And Pete, are you getting anybody else? No, you know what? I don't know if you got my email, but Bill and Sam had a couple personal things come up, so they're not gonna be able to join. So you got me tonight. Okay. So let's start off. Um we're gonna start off very quickly with communications. Have we had any communications from deep? that anybody's aware of? No, okay. How, nope. about, from, how about from shellfish? None nothing, from shellfish. yeah, nothing water quality related. Um, okay, um, and anything from the city, planning and zoning, no. or the health department? Nor ever uh, Not Nothing from the health department this evening, Joe. Okay, good. So then, Peter, let's get right to you right away. Uh, you said you had something you wanted us to start off with, so let's start off with that. We can go right to the to the Me questions. Too. All right, you guys all see my screen? Yep. All right, excellent. Okay. Oh, good, Dick, glad to hear it. So uh, happy to be here. I think we've talked for about two years. Um, last time we spoke, my wife was pregnant and now I have a 19 month old. And I was joking around with Bill, which uh, promptly bumped me out of my office and into my guest bedroom for these uh, evening meetings. So um, if he also just got home from daycare. So if you hear him in the background, that's our, that's our boy, Luke. Um, but my name's Peter. Uh, so I, I think I spoke with most of you, but I'm the director of water quality at Save the Sound. Uh, I know you're on a tight schedule, so I won't go too long into my own bio, but you know, I grew up on in and around the sound and I try to continue that as much as I can as an adult. And uh, you know, happy to be working at a place like Save the Sound, we're really focused on protecting, restoring Long Island Sound. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna be touching base with you all on the Long Island Sound report card. Uh, we just recently, as you all know, released the 2022 report card. And then a little bit more into the details of Norwalk Harbor, the grade at Norwalk Harbor, some of the challenges that, that many of you might be familiar with, and then maybe some ways that we can collaborate. Um, so again, report card overview, going into Norwalk Harbor in detail. And then um, on this invitation that I got to uh, join and speak with you all, there was uh, also some, you know, some willingness to discuss collaboration ideas. So really happy to do that and do my best to save some time for uh, questions, comments, and discussion. So starting with the report card, uh, the report card uh, grades the environmental health of Long Island Sound. It grades the health of uh, the open sound, regions of the open sound, and also around the margins and the bays and harbors. And I think it's important to quickly touch base with you all on where those data come from. So for the open sound, uh, we are receiving data from the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, Interstate Environmental Commission, uh, as we move west into the sound here, are the stations that we use from them, as you can see, the circled stations are more in open sound than in embayments. That was a that was on purpose, of course. Uh, then we use New York City Department of Environmental Protection data, uh, especially for the Western Narrows grade. And and like I mentioned, we use deep data as well. And you know, as you know, they have quite a few stations. Um, we use as many of them um, as we can. We tend not to use a lot of these outer eastern kind of shoreline stations as they don't get monitored um, all year. You could see the, the stations that get monitored by deep all year have um, underlines under them and they go down to monthly sampling in the winter months when they're doing their hypoxia sampling in their summer season and, and kind of like May to October like season, they start adding more stations and drop those as hypoxia um, comes and goes. So. Kind of we could chat more about that if that wasn't a great summary, but I think you kind of get the point. Um, so these are the open water grade data sources. And then for the bay grades, which includes Norwalk Harbor, um, those are fueled by data from the Unified Water Study. Um, that's a water quality monitoring program for community science groups, you know, but it includes all different types of groups. Um, we're up to this 2023 season, we're gonna have 27 groups that include Save the Sound, uh, monitoring 45 Long Island Sound embayments. And some of those embayments are split into multiple segments. So Norwalk Harbor is a great example of that. Inner, middle, outer, Manhasset Bay, North Shore Long Island is similar. Some of them are split into two segments, 
But what we're looking at here are all the embayments in full that have monitoring occurring as part of the unified water study. Um, and there's, you know, there's over 220 stations that are monitored. So this is an easier way to look at it. But keep in mind that every embayment, like Scott's Cove and Darien is a good example. It's kind of a smaller one. At minimum, they all have four stations. And then um, for some of the larger ones, um, they have at least three stations per segment. So, um, you know, up to nine, all the way up to about 12 stations is where we cap it off. And we go through a, a station selection process with every group when they join to get uh, as representative sampling as we can. We do random station generation, but we also look at um, some of the existing stations that groups may have already been monitoring. I mean, Harbor Watch is a great example. They have uh, stations in the inner and middle harbor. And, you know, we looked at those when we were selecting stations so we could build on um, older data sets. And so all the groups in the unified water study um, monitor what we call tier one. Um, so these are the parameters in the, in the top left of my screen. Um, they're all monitoring dissolved oxygen, turbidity, chlorophyll A, qualitative macrophytes, temperature, and salinity. So that's baseline. All 40, you know, five embayments are receiving um, those parameters. Those are the parameters, uh, temp and salinity not included yet at least, that we put in the Long Island Sound Report Card. All embayments have it. Tier two, extra monitoring. Oftentimes that's um, informed by management needs. Like when the Long Island Sound study, for example, put out priority embayments around the sound, we, we quickly tried to put resources towards continuous dissolved oxygen monitoring, quantitative macrophyte monitoring and nutrient monitoring and those embayments. We don't include those data in the report card because they're not collected in every single embayment. We really want apples to apples comparisons. So all the groups are out there. And again, Save the Sound is a monitoring group, but we, we monitor further west. We're East Chester Bay in New York City, uh, New Rochelle Harbor and Hunter's Island Bay, if you're familiar with the Western Sound. But um, all the groups are out conducting this monitoring following an EPA quality assurance project plan some of you are familiar with what that is, but just, you know, it's a very, you know, it's as needed lengthy document, technical document that outlines, you know, how instruments are calibrated, how they're used in the field, um, what time of day the monitoring occurs, um, how frequently the monitoring occurs, uh, and there's lots more details, standard operating procedures. We administer that quality assurance project plan because this program is fully funded by the EPA Long Island Sound Study. It requires a quality assurance project plan. But it also is really good for data tracking, um, quality assurance purposes are built in. It, it informs our review process of those data before they're released. Um, and just keep in mind the entire program um, is underneath this quality assurance project plan. And what it gives us is com comparable data. Um, there's really, there's great monitoring programs that, it, that really are, and I'm not just saying this, I mean, that existed before the Unified Water Study came about. Um, but comparing data between groups could be somewhat of a challenge. Some groups might go out in the middle of the day. Some were out early in the morning. Some were using Lamont titration kits for dissolved oxygen. Some people were using YSIs. Some groups didn't even know how to calibrate a sun. I'm not naming anyone. But, and some groups were you know, calibrating the day before and the day after, whatever it may be. But what we did here is standardize the process, which gives us the ability to compare across embayments and to create grades across embayments. Um, very important um, implication. And you know, no embayment is exactly the same. So really nothing's perfect, right? But we, we did our best here to make an achievable water quality monitoring program that also has very traceable like roots to its data in addition to everyone doing the same thing every year when they're out. The monitoring season six months, I, I believe this is one of the questions that you all had. Um, that's, that's a pretty common monitoring season from May to October. It encompasses our main aquatic growing season. Um, we're looking for um, impacts from nitrogen and eutrophication impacts. So hypoxia, for example, is a very seasonal occurrence, as you all know, in Long Island Sound. Typically, it's occurring, you know, June, July, August, maybe early September. Um, and you see that in DEEPS reports that are funded by the Long Island Sound Study and the hypoxia reports. Um, and then it, it tends to taper off as we move into fall. So that's our selected monitoring season, May through October, and it's uh, six months. This is the last report card that we issued 2022. Keep in mind, we did three before this. Um, these are the groups that provide the data. I, you know, I wish I could call every single one out. For, for the, um, excuse me, for Norwalk Harbor, it's Harbor Watch in the inner and middle segments, and then the Maritime Aquarium 
does the monitoring in the outer segment. Um, I'm not going to, you can't read all this. I'd have to get very close, but I just want to, I, I hope that many of you have picked up the report card and read through it. You can read through it quickly, Saturday morning with your coffee or tea or whatever your beverage of choice is Saturday morning. But um, I, just please give it a read. Uh, it has really important to take action sheet. Uh, it's a fourfold, by the way. That's why I'm looking at it this, you're seeing it this way. But things that people can do, your everyday, you know, residents, people can do to uh, improve water quality. Uh, it has a, you know, bracing for climate change. There was some discussion from this group on, you know, temperature. Are we looking at temperature? Yes, we monitor temperature. It's not included in the report card yet, but we do talk about it. I mean, it's a very real threat to the sound, climate change. Uh, we specifically reference a paper that came out that talks about warming in the Western sound, though, that can be moved to the entire sound and the implications that will have on dissolved oxygen and nitrogen management, the two are very linked. Um, and the gains that we've seen in the open sound might start to be offset with warmer water. So we really do talk about temperature and, and how it is related to these data and these grades. Talk about ways the uh, report card's been used. I think another really important section for you all to read is this blue section, how's the water? That's an executive summary. Talks about the open sound. Um, we have you know over 14 years of uh, grades that have gone into the open sound grades at this point. And then it does an executive summary for the water quality in our bays or the bay grades. Um, and it, you know, it specifies that there, there's challenges in these bays. I mean, that's known. There's uh, nitrogen strategies being developed for reducing nitrogen coming into these embayments to improve water quality. Um, it also talks about in this executive summary how you know embayments have these sections, you know, in particular the large ones, you're going to be able to see this actually, maybe this way is a better way to look at it, where, you know, their outer portions are often, you know, very well flushed with the sound. Um, but as you move in, into the inner portions of embayments, you tend to see poor water quality. And I mean, that that is a function of a section of the bay that's not flushed as well as the outer portion. And it, it what it does is it creates a, a an area of that bay, that harbor, that inlet, where additional action should be taken to help improve water quality. You know, it, they're not flushed as much and they are much more susceptible to the nitrogen loads and other pollutant loads that are coming from the rivers as they enter that inner portion. Um, so that's, you know, that's highlighted with Norwalk Harbor. You could see it in these North Shore Long Island embayments, certainly East Chester Bay here. You know, it's, it's not an uncommon um, concept and, and reality really. So I'd also like to point you to the Sound Health Explorer. This, this is the digital home of the Long Island Sound Report Card. Um, here's where you could go in, you can click on these regions and segments and get a lot more information. Here's Inner Norwalk Harbor. This is just recently, 2022, right? Previous years, actually, I was taking a look. Um, these were, I think, both Bs and this was getting an F. So there's a little bit of a change. We're really careful not to get too deep. I'm, it's great. I'm really happy to see that it's a D, not an F. But we're careful not to um, do, you know, one year, two years, you know, we have in some of these embayments up to five years of data and grades now. So you all know, kind of a sneak preview, our next release, we'll be looking at tying in a little bit of preliminary trend analyses um, that like we do in the open water, we're at 14 years of grades and data, right? So we're, we're careful about that. But this is the current um, standing with uh, Norwalk Harbor for 2022. Keep in mind, as Joe pointed out in his email and as the report card states, these are based on 2021 data. The monitoring season ends, of course, in October. Groups need to get us all their data. We go through a quality assurance process, et cetera. And then each report card is a reflection of the data from the year before. So digging into Inner Norwalk Harbor. So if you came into Sound Health Explorer, clicked on Inner Norwalk Harbor, you would come to this landing page where you'd see the monitoring group that's doing the actual in the field monitoring. I didn't mention it, <clears throat> excuse me, before, but we also standardize the equipment and calibration standards and everything. Um, they come from Save the Sound as a loan program. Harbor Watch actually started that loan program though early on in the unified water study days. That's when Sarah Crosby was still director there. And uh, it, it came over to Save the Sound in the long run. So now we have, you know, 20, you know, 27 multi-parameter SONs in our office that we do upkeep on in the winter. That's another thing I should mention. But here's Inner Norwalk Harbor. Um, you can look at the grades. I didn't include a ton of information on the grading process for this presentation, 
we do have a, um, it's essentially a white paper that goes over the background of the grades and the grading formulas, the continuous formulas, functions that are used, um, the ways that we evaluate the data. Like for example, for dissolved oxygen, we take by segment the um, three lowest dates. So we take by segment, we do averages of all the bottom dissolved oxygen by date, you know, up to like 12 or 13 of those. We look at the three lowest, it's about 25% of the data. And then with that, we take an average and that's the dissolved oxygen value that gets graded. So I really do think, Joe, I'd like to share that with you. Um, it's public information, don't get me wrong, but I'd like to get it to you. It's a very large, like in terms of size, because that's a lot of figures and images um, document. And then you, you can all review it and you can maybe get a better understanding of the, the mechanisms behind the, the grading process as well, not just where the data come from. So, you know, there's been discussion about this grade and, you know, the background on the grade, the data for the grade, and, you know, you've been very clear about your, you know, questions and such. So I just want to point out, you know, we have years of data and grades for Inner Norwalk Harbor. It's going to serve as a really wonderful baseline um, of like the same data collection, the same, you know, grading process. So as things come in place, which we hope to work with you all on and water quality gets better, this is going to be one of the programs, if not the program, that'll help show the improvements based on, you know, actions that are taken by the city and, and throughout the watershed, frankly, as well. But I, I do want to point out too, so I've mentioned this before, I think we talked about it a couple of years ago, Inner Norwalk Harbor is also on the Connecticut um, Impaired Watersway list, or the 303D list. Um, and this is just one page, this is just page 31, so don't think it's all Norwalk on here. There's lots of waterways, unfortunately, that are on this list. Um, but this is <clears throat> this is essentially what DEEP provides to Congress. It gives it to the EPA Congress. It's part of the Clean Water Act. Um, and it, it's listing the waterways that are not meeting water quality criteria, and they're not in essentially compliance with the Clean Water Act. Um, they're impaired. They're not meeting their designated uses. Um, and this is, you know, while the Unified Water Study data does go to the state and helps them with these assessments and impairment listings, um, Inner Norwalk Harbor has been listed 2016 and, and before the Unified Water Study even existed on this list. I just wanted to show you and provide a link to the um, most updated list. So this is something, you know, if you're not already very familiar with, I'd encourage you to take a look at. You can see that, you know, lead, total nitrogen, mercury, nutrients, enterococci or enterococcus and dissolved oxygen are all causes for impairments in Inner Norwalk Harbor. And you can see the uses, Clean Water Act terminology that are being impaired. So you know, enterococcus, of course, impairs swimming and recreation. There's no swimming beaches in the inner Norwalk Harbor, but there's still, you know, a look at fecal indicator bacteria. That's not what the report card's about, mind you. Um, but nutrients, you know, impairing the waterway for aquatic life, et cetera. So please, you know, take a look at this. Um, I could send this PowerPoint. It has links in it. And you, you know, you have that information at your fingertips. Hey, Peter? Yeah. Uh, while you're there, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, you say it's an impairment for habitat for marine fish, other aquatic life, and, and wildlife. Yet we know that hundreds of waterfowl right. hang out in that area. Hundreds. Now, if it's an impairment, they would not be there. But they also, because they are there, they contribute to the nitrogen. They contribute right. to the enterococcus. They contribute to other neat, uh, other do. nutrients. And do we have to stand in the harbor and shoot guns off to keep them away? Right. If you are you talking about geese and other waterfowl? Well, geese, swans, um, brant. brant, brant, yeah, brant, sure. So I mean, it, 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 I'm, when I say <laughs> hundreds, I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. No, I believe you. Actually, that's a uh, that's an issue. As we all know, waterfowl and, and um, resident geese in particular, um, that many municipalities have to uh, work to try to manage as best they can. Um, but just to be clear, this is not my, this is actually from the state of Connecticut, and it's based on information and data they have for impairments. So I just wanted okay. to point out it's not just all the report card, which is data based and such. And this is too, but it looks at models and other things. I, um, I understand that. But yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. There's lots of impaired waterways that still have some functionality. It, it doesn't imply that it's a dead zone. And um, well, the, the other aspect of this, and, and 
forgive me for being as old as I am, but <laughs> you're when, young at when, heart, Joe. Yeah, when I went to school, Peter, we were told to challenge what we were what we were being taught. Right. And I'm I'm challenging not the not the testing, not, the, not at all. Right. What I'm challenging is the grade and, and why the grade. And there's no look at Okay, we have the Stuart B. McKinney National Wildlife Refuge out there, and we are supposed to be an area where you're supposed to have a habitat for marine fish and, and other wildlife, and we do have all of that stuff. Right. So keep in mind, Joe, that this is specific to like the grade for the outer portion of the harbor, I believe is an A minus. Um, water quality has yeah. been improving out here, and that's actually pretty good. Um, Deep does a listing a little different than ours. They don't break it up as segmented. They call the inner harbor, I believe they draw their line here, and then go in. Our inner harbor really is looking at this portion, correct? Um, which has drastically water, water different things going on than the outer portion. So absolutely, just keep it in mind. So that impairment does not, in, not indicating that this whole portion of Norwalk Harbor is impaired by any means. I I absolutely understand that, and and. The, and that's the, deeps impairment. So we have the grade and the and the deeps impairment listing. I just wanted to point out there were two. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I think everybody in my committee here understands that. But what we don't understand is why an F grade or a D minus is given when it be it is obviously a viable body of water. And yeah, I'm going to send you the grading. Uh, I'll send you the grading schematic. And you got to remember, every embayment is treated the same way. So those inner portions are struggling often in terms of water quality. So um, let's keep moving, Joe. But I want to get you because I know you're on a tight. I, I'm, I can talk longer, but I know you're on a tight deadline. But I think to your point, you know, every embayment in the report card is treated the same way. Every segment is graded the same way. Some of them do have more challenges than others, right? That all impact is all the oxygen and flushing and, and other things. And that just makes, it, it's, it's the same with the Western Sound, right? When you look at the Western Sound, you know, of course, this Western Narrows portion is much more stressed in, than the Eastern Basin, right? It just doesn't have the flushing. It's got New York City. You know, this, we actually had some good news here. This one's showing some statistical improvement in dissolved organic carbon, the nutrient grade. But, you know, it's going to take more to get those portions up. And I really just want to reiterate again, it does not imply it's a dead zone, right? Like I know Inner Norwalk Harbor, you all know Inner Norwalk Harbor. It's not a complete dead zone, but it does have bouts of hypoxia and anoxia where there's no oxygen in the water. I mean, the data show that. Um, and all it takes for hypoxia is it's an acute criteria, right? So you get under three milligrams per liter and you're hypoxic. You get closer to zero and it's anoxic. And that is a recipe for disaster when it comes to wildlife. So it's important to keep that in mind, but in no way, and I, I just want to be really clear, in no way, like there's, there's inner East Chester Bay, Joe, I see it as very similar to Norwalk Harbor in some ways, the inner portion, at least not the outer portion. It's also one side, you've got a huge New York City park. The other side, you've got co-op city and all kinds of industrial activities. And there's plenty of fish and birds and wonderful things going on in there. Um, but, you know, we've documented anoxia and I've seen thousands and thousands of dead fish in the inner portion many times, unfortunately, multiple times. And of course, that's something we want to get away from. But, Peter, but it's like a ticking time bomb more than a continuum of like, it's just a dead zone. Peter, there's there's no question about that. The, the, but the question becomes, we know when the water temperature gets up around 70 degrees and higher we're going to get hypoxia and anoxia. That's a given. We can't control that. You know, I, unless God can put uh, giant ice cubes in the <laughs> river for us, right. we're, not, we're, we're not going to be able to cool it down. Well, you can cool it down. You can reduce impervious surface runoff. You can decrease <laughs> heat island effects. You can, you know, there's different strategies in place that can help cool the water down. In, it increase canopy coverage as best you can. I mean, this is these are not things that are easy. I'm not saying that in respect. It's a highly urbanized area, right? Um, you look at the shoreline of the Inner Norwalk Harbor, and you've got lots of development. You've got industrial activities, lots of hard, hardened surfaces, and 
and uh, seawalls. None of that is helping with temperature, Joe. I, All of that I mean, is, is leading to, so what we do and what we can do is take the things that we can control and you know, reducing nitrogen from stormwater runoff and reducing nitrogen in the watershed. And you know, as a municipality, it, it's sometimes it's challenging, right? To do intermunicipal agreements, to do these types of things. But, you know, and we're gonna go, I, I'd like to go through some of the challenges and ways that hopefully we could work together um, to reduce some of the stressors on that portion of the harbor. And do I think it's gonna go from a D to an A in any short amount of time? No, not necessarily. And since the way it's positioned and the challenges that it faces, maybe the best it can hope for is a C or a B. But, you know, let's try to get there. And hopefully we could get there together. But I, I do hear you loud and clear with what you're talking about. And I do know that that portion, in addition to other embayments that have those kind of smaller, not flushing well portions, um, they have additional stressors just built in that are, that are to a degree out of our control. We can only do what we can do. I agree with you. Thank you. This one, I put this out here. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, nitrogen loading model that uh, Jamie Vaudry and colleagues up at UConn and, and not just at UConn put together. I, I, I included the link. I think this would be a great thing. I don't know if you all have working sessions or if you have um, times that you meet. Well, you could even do it in public or, or just go take this link and take a look. But you could go to Norwalk Harbor. You could go to any of the other you know, 100 plus embayments around the sound. And you could look at the nitrogen entering that system. So this is just for Norwalk Harbor. And one thing, you know, I didn't, we don't have an hour here today, obviously, but as you go into this, you can also scroll down and look at these nitrogen sources according to how close they are to say Norwalk Harbor. Um, they've done work to um, quantify the nitrogen load within the 200 meter buffer, for example, from the outside the 200 meter buffer, but still direct discharge. And then outside of that, which, you know, is very important for a thing like a uh, waterway like Norwalk Harbor or any of them, because, you know, you all know Norwalk Harbor's watershed extends well beyond Norwalk, um, Norwalk River, excuse me, which comes into the harbor. So, you know, this is a really valuable tool. It can help put things into perspective. I mean, one thing that jumps out, obviously, looking at this is that 65% of the nitrogen entering Norwalk Harbor is coming from the um, sanitary sewer system. That's treated effluent, but it still has nitrogen in it, right? And so that's one thing to consider. We, sh we should talk more about that. But it also puts slivers into you know, in the whole watershed, atmospheric deposition from stormwater, though, I, we're going to look at Norwalk's immediate um, uh, impervious coverage around the river shortly, um, but also fertilizer and uh, septic systems. And I don't think there's a lot of septic systems in, in the city of Norwalk proper, maybe as you get a little bit further outside of, you know, past 95 and up towards Wilton. But, you know, it shows that 12% of the nitrogen coming into Norwalk Harbor is coming from septic. So that's another area that might be you know, worth taking a look at. It's a really valuable tool. I just, I'd encourage you all to take a look at it. If we want to have another meeting where I could invite Dr. Vaudry, she's a member of our team, to kind of really go through this in detail, I'd be happy to do so. This, this sort of gets to what, you know, what Joe's mentioning as well, where, you know, for, for inner Norwalk Harbor specifically, I, I just picked one day where hypoxia was present. There was, I think from 2018 to 2021, I was looking through the data, there were about 21 days where um, there was either anoxia or hypoxia at at least one of the stations in inner Norwalk Harbor. And, you know, they often follow this pattern. It's not always, these are the monitoring stations on the map. This is the inner, innermost station, which is obviously going to be the most stressed um, in respect to impervious coverage and this pinch point and the temperature, like Joe mentioned, down to this um, outer um, O4. You know, they don't always go from 1.54 up here to five milligrams per liter. Sometimes they, they are all in the threes. Sometimes I've seen O1 go down to like 0.4 milligrams per liter. Um, but it, it definitely shows that impact of the inner portion, even of a segment um, being more stressed. So I just, you know, we could look at and put together 21 of these, but I did notice just by reviewing the spreadsheets, they all follow a similar pattern. And, you know, it starts to get into impervious cover. I, I've heard this committee commission talk, and I'll try to pick it up a little bit, but I've heard you all talking about impervious coverage. And I, I think that's an important thing for this committee um, to just keep on your agenda. Um, that would be a recommendation for me and something we'd be happy to communicate on. Because when you look at the entire watershed of Norwalk River, it's about 13 and a half percent 
impervious coverage. So it's not at 12%, which I'm going to show shortly is a recommended uh, number for, for healthy um, waters. But when you look at munis the municipality of Norwalk, the total impervious coverage in the municipality is 32%, um, which is, you know, it's high. It's a city. It's an urban area. It's not the only one in the this, sound this that's like that. And as you dig in, uh, this is all available, by the way, through um, CLEAR and NEMO. Those are uh, programs funded by Connecticut DEEP. This isn't Save the Sound data, but here's the link so you can get to it. Um, as you dig in to this inner portion of the harbor, it's 52% impervious coverage. So that is going to have impacts on temperature. You, you don't have much canopy. Um, that's tree canopy intercepting sunlight. Um, a lot of direct discharge of stormwater and the nitrogen that's within it, even just what it picks up from the atmosphere as it falls, not just fertilizer and other things. Um, so that is an issue. Um, and that's an issue in many urbanized areas. I don't think that Norwalk's unique in that, but I think these numbers help quantify it for everybody. And to look at a 52% IC impervious coverage surface in that portion of the harbor, that'd be an area that if I were, you know, directly looking to make some improvements, I would be looking at. Uh, reducing that impervious coverage. <clears throat> Here's looking at another map of Norwalk Harbor and impervious coverage. This is, I found this on your website. This is a deep document though. And as you look at this, uh, I heard someone mentioning, you know, where, where's the research to support impervious coverage um, reduction? You, know, you could read it here. Connecticut strongly suggests, you know, aquatic life will be harmed within a watershed if it exceeds 12% impervious coverage. So you can see, and this again, it's just something that needs to be looked at that these dark red areas are 76 to 100% impervious coverage. So that's just 100% concrete, asphalt, you know, roofs, things like that. And, you know, furthermore, digging into this, I would look here and then start looking at some of those areas adjacent to Norwalk Harbor as places that, where possible, it's not the easiest place to infiltrate stormwater, right? But where possible, try to reduce those down, um, take away some of those direct discharges, get some more trees lining the river in those areas, you know, whatever can be done. But I, I'd encourage you to look at this as well. And I know that Norwalk's also um, growing. You know, I think the state of Connecticut as a whole, I can't remember what the growth rate is, but Norwalk is growing population wise. And I think smart development and growth is going to be very important to, you know, try to protect and then in the future restore um, this inner innermost portion of the harbor in particular. Okay, just a few more and then I, I'd like to get to collaboration ideas. So um, another thing that, you know, should be looked at is that uh, Norwalk and other areas have pretty antiquated sewage systems, uh, really good people running them, don't get me wrong, but the systems themselves, especially those underground pipes, they're, they're, they're getting pretty old, right? So this is just one map of um, sanitary sewer overflows that have occurred in Norwalk. I mean, you can see some from the adjacent municipalities. That's uh, raw sewage discharging out of manholes um, or other areas. So that's obviously something everyone should strive to reduce. Um, I know that there's, you know, it's not why I'm here to talk today. I just wanted to point it out. This information's there. You could see 2016 to 2021 through this link, 2022 to 2023. I think I saw about 12 that occurred um, in that time frame up to about now. So, you know, tightening up the system, trying to reduce inflow and infiltration to your sanitary sewer system goes a long way for water quality, greenhouse gas emissions. You know, there's no reason to treat um, fresh water in a wastewater treatment plant. It should be just sanitary sewage making its way to the plant and not coming out of manholes in other places. Um, I believe there's a consent. So again, I, I'm not here to chat legal, um, but you know, I know there's a, a, a consent order. There's studies ongoing to look at this and to start to address this issue. This is the one, I believe, uh, combined sewer overflow permitted. Um, and I know that that's also listed in the consent order, but you know, there's definite evidence that you know, combined, even, it, even as infrequent, I believe, as this one discharges, um, there's evidence that that's a high organic matter load to the sediments, um, which can increase microbial activity in the long run and start to also fluctuate your oxygen concentrations and start to take it away from just primary productivity, like chlorophyll, for example, making and using, or phytoplankton making and using oxygen, but it starts to bring in microbes and other things and, and the sediment demand. So, you know, I think it's 10 years um, that's listed in that order for that to be removed or at least to hit primary treatment, though the primary treatment wouldn't that's like a chlorination likely that wouldn't help with the nitrogen and, and organic matter association necessarily. So that that's ongoing, but I just wanted to point it out as a stressor, I know. And then, you know, collaboration and ideas. I mean, we're following this. This is Black Rock Harbor. It also has a, a wastewater treatment outfall like Norwalk deep 
within the harbor, deep in the inner portion of Black Rock Harbor. This is where the sewage treated comes out. You know, we're following the science on this. There, there very well could be uh, new total maximum daily loads for nitrogen coming out for Connecticut embayments that might include wastewater treatment plant reductions further than what the 2000 Long Island Sound TMDL dictated, which has been met, right? And I was quickly scanning um, the ECHO database in EPA, and it does look like the wastewater treatment plant in Norwalk does meet nitrogen limits. It had a couple exceedances here and there. It doesn't look chronic, but that's meeting a, a TMDL that was set for the open sound. And it might be that these, you know, Stamford, Black Rock, there's a couple more. They had these outfalls, Norwalk, that are deep in the embayment. That's going to introduce nitrogen, even if it's treated. And, you know, we might need to start reconsidering how much nitrogen is coming from that water and the impacts it has on water quality. And EPA certainly is, I'm on this technical work group, looking at uh, nitrogen target concentrations um, and Connecticut's doing some modeling and other such work that may inform those TMDLs as well. That activity is happening. So, you know, it's the kind of thing we could follow, this committee could follow to kind of stay proactive on and provide comments on. And the last two before opening it up, um, these are places where we'd love to work with you all and the city of Norwalk. And I'm, by no means am I saying this is not happening because I know it is in Norwalk to a degree. Um, but green infrastructure, habitat restoration, big municipal projects. This is one that we did in Sunken Meadow. Um, that's North Shore, Long Island, where we took, this was all pavement. And we put in porous pavement. We put in bioswales. We restored the marsh. Lots of things that we did. And this, this goes to the Nisiquag River. Um, and it's going to help with water quality in the Nisiquag River in Long Island. And you could do these on a smaller scale, too. Municipal parking lots, trying to go porous pavement, trying to put in green roofs, whatever you can do. Um, we'll go a long way. And we are more than happy. I talked with our restoration team to collaborate with you all on that. We'd love to be partners with you on those. You know, encouraging um, residents to install rain gardens, to put rain barrels in, you know, one rain barrel, one residential rain garden that's, you know, being fed from a downspout. You know, what, what is that going to make a quantifiable difference? Probably not. But will hundreds? Yeah, it probably will. And you know, it, it's demonstrated to just reduce the stormwater runoff. We're, we're doing this with the city of Rye. Um, and there's other examples where, you know, encouraging residents to put these things in, make it a make it an item they just they want to do, you know, <laughs> popular kids, popular adults, put them in, whatever it is, you know, get them in. It's it's really goes a long way for local water quality. And, you know, where it's not possible, like a city an urbanized area, those residents can advocate for the city to do what they can in the municipal properties. Um, as much as possible. Fertilizer, um, that, that you know, for urbanized Norwalk, but there's still yards. So do less. I love that. You know, when my wife gets on my case about the grass getting long, I tell her it's better for the environment. You know, I'll cut it. You know, don't trim the grass so it's this short. You know, see if Norwalk, if they haven't already, can adopt an electrical fleet of, um, you know, lawnmowers and other things and mulch leaves, you know, plant native. This stuff is happening but it's something we'd be happy to help amplify local messaging on with Norwalk and with other groups in the area, including the Watershed Association and other groups that I know are working on this, but it's, it's a, you know, something that just should keep getting hammered on. Okay, so with that, I'll stop sharing for now, but I could go back to the slides and I can definitely take some questions um, or comments <laughs> or have some discussion. I have Joe, a this is Jeff. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Jeff. Oh, hi, hi Peter. Uh, may may I make a couple of comments and ask a qu question, perhaps? Or yeah, you got to ask Joe, not me. Yeah, of course you can. Go for oh. it. Oh, yeah, I'm asking Joe. So, Peter, we, we've had we talk about the the uh, the wastewater treatment system in Norwalk. Can, can you give us some uh, understanding or background as to the current? consent order between the city of Norwalk and, and DEP for certain improvements in the wastewater treatment plant. Was your organization involved in the development of that or, or the impetus for that? And is, is that not an you example know, of the improvements so, that we're talking about? To yeah, the consent order does outline improvements that would be coming in place. Like I said, like the CSO, um, near the wastewater treatment plant, you know, taking that offline completely. And that's that's also an EPA, like long-term control plans are required by the EPA. So it's not just, but the consent order talking with DEEP. Um, so DEEP issues their own consent orders. You know, we don't go in there and look, Norwalk needs a consent order. We've certainly been following it. I think you've had discussions and many of you with our legal department. Um, 
So while I'm not really going to, I personally shouldn't be the one that goes into the exact legalities of it because I can talk as you all know, and I don't want to overstep my, mm -hmm. you know, my, my, um, my, my ways. But what I, what I can say is that, you know, inflow and infiltration um, is an issue, not just at Norwalk, but other places and sanitary sewer overflows are an issue. They're a public health risk. Um, they should be need to be reduced. There's no question about that. I don't think anyone on this committee would question that. You know, should we have sanitary sewer overflows? Absolutely not. You shouldn't have raw sewage running on the streets. Um, and should we have CSOs? I mean, frankly, most of the public don't understand like CSO, right? We swim in acronym soup. I don't think a lot of people realize there are times when raw sewage is discharged in that area. Um, that's another thing we should all strive to not have happen. Um, I, I believe Norwalk, you know, I haven't looked recently. I forget what the, the actual precipitation threshold is for that CSO firing off. I've seen it happen. When I worked at the aquarium with Joe, I looked out the window and I've seen it happen, but I don't think it's incredibly chronic, but I think working to get rid of it is important, Jeff. And sorry, I can't give much of the legal ins and outs, but I can tell you that we do not, you know, push deep to do like we, we weren't involved in, you know, I think your mayor signed it. You probably looked at it. The DPW department looked at it and, and it's an active consent order that needs to be met now. Thank you. I'll just say what, what I'm talking and then I'll stop and try to do this quickly. But we're talking about the, 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 the body and the historic body of, of information and, and studies that are contributing to this. And I, I think we also just need to acknowledge the, the three substantial pieces of work that were uh, <clears throat> done by the Harbor Management Commission and the Shellfish Commission. Mm. And the first was, I was, it was less than 10 years ago, but it, but it supports what you just said about the, the impervious surfaces and their significance in the urbanized part of the watershed. So we, we had, I don't know if I shared this with you, Peter, but we had a water quality scientist, the, the Professor Hart from New York State, but he looked at, at the, the collected bacteria sample data that was Har Harbor Watch collected in the river mm -hmm. all the way up to Richfield. And then he also looked at the, at the data that was collected of bacteria by the Bureau of Aquaculture in the harbor. And then he went through all of that and, and came up with matched pairs where he could try to try to relate the, the, the elevated counts in the river with the elevated counts at a, at a site in, in the harbor. And mm. he did quite a bit of work on that, but, but his conclusion was that the high levels of bacteria found in the upper reaches of the watershed <clears throat> did not affect the, the, the counts that, that the Bureau of Aquaculture found in the harbor. But the, but the high counts in the middle part of the watershed in the urbanized area did. You could make, he made that linkage between the elevated bacteria in the middle part of the watershed and in the, in the harbor itself. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the second study, I think, that was especially beneficial was the study we did um, of, the, of the highway pollutants of, off of the I-95 bridge. Right. So we, we analyzed the urban meeting, but Professor Hart did. He compared highway pollutants with the, with, the, with the contaminants found in the dredge material underneath the bridge and could make a direct link between the highway pollutants and, and what was found in the, in the harbor sediments. And as a result, that, as, as a result of that, we, we were able to influence the, the, the DOT's design of the bridge refurbishment to capture the runoff from 80% of the bridge deck off, off to the side. Yeah, so we believe is, is a model that should be promoted and used for other highway infrastructure in Connecticut, that it yeah. is possible to capture the bridge deck runoff. And then the third one um, has to do with, with the analysis of the DOT's turbidity data that was collected for the Walk Bridge project. We, we never saw analysis from DOT, but, but, uh, but the scientist that we retained, he analyzed, I don't know how many thousands of, of, of pieces of data and related the, the spikes in the, that were found in the turbidity to tide and rainfall and some other conditions, and and those those that analysis help us help form our our recommendations, and we discussed this for turbidity monitoring during the, during the bridge project. Right. But unfortunately, those recommendations. Yeah. But unfortunately, those recommendations were were uh, I don't want to say uh, they, they they weren't cons they weren't. Not discarded, but they weren't included in the in the in the uh, in the permit, which mm. we think is, is is something that we think was not the right thing to do. But but again, talking about working together, and and, and uh, I, I think is a very important point. And I just wanted to mention that part of this this work 
that's done not just your group and, and Harbor Watch, but also the work that, that the Harbor Commission and the Shellfish Commission have, have promoted. I think that should Absolutely. be part of the record and we all all work together moving forward. Th th thank you. Sorry to yeah. talk so long. No, that's thank you, Jeff. I think Diane has her hand up. Hi, Peter. Thank hey. you for lower my hand here. Thank you for uh, coming to talk with us. Um, uh, many of us over time, as you said, have mentioned uh, the alternative ways that we could cool down, clean up, and slow down polluted runoff. And uh, so the thing is, uh, in a way, we're very lucky in that the city agreed uh, to update and, and revise and rewrite their zoning regulations. So I wanted to know if you have, uh, and, and we know that land use is one way to um, reduce polluted runoff in, in all of its ways. And I wanted to know if you had any model language because mm. right now, as we speak, our zoning department is actually, uh, we have a consultant helping. They're gearing up for um, a public meeting probably next month, I, I hear. Um, and so wanted, and secondly, uh, it's uh, the moon and stars aligned because the Wall Street area, which had suffered from uh, up and down development and renovation since the 1955 flood, we have a good team together again under the administration and our uh, TMP division. Uh, they have big plans for enlivening Wall Street. And I went to one of their open houses and, tr and said, listen, this is an opportunity also for water quality uh, 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 improvement. So um, that's why the model language, I think, and there, so I wanted to know, I think you could just put your fingers on our Bill Lucy could. Uh, we yeah. could as well, but we, we want to help our um, planning and zoning department and that whole um, area uh, to take a look at this and implement it across the board eventually, but in the meantime, in the Wall Street area update. Thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. And um, you know, we run an interdepartmental meeting uh, on Thursdays today, <laughs> but I run it every Thursday at three. So that'll have our legal eco soundkeeper, you know, a bunch of us on. And I'm gonna I'm gonna run that by them, Diane, looking for um, model language on land use, maybe zoning even, um, that you know could could potentially be uh, used for that for that. And I'm glad that your heads and not just you, I'm sure, is going there. You know, as you're revitalizing and working on an area, of course. I mean, in an area like this, water quality should be considered, and it could be considered in a way that just further you know makes that area more approachable in a way for people, you know, and just and just a prettier area, but then it also has water quality implications. So yes, we'd be more than happy to uh, contribute to some model language for you to consider. I'm also gonna talk to our, we actually have a lands department and uh, I'm gonna actually, they're in that meeting too. I'm gonna start with them and I can get, when I send Joe that document on the grading, um, I can uh, follow up on that as well. Thank Please. you. Please. Hey. hey. Yeah, hi. I have a, just a very basic question. I don't, how, so for the wastewater treatment plant, they have the ability to remove nitrogen, but they own, how does that work? They only remove the amount required or what's yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. So there's a cost to removing nitrogen, right? And I'm not an engineer, so I won't overstep my bounds here, but yes, wastewater treatment plants reduce nitrogen um, through different um, forms. I, I, I can't recall exactly what Norwalk secondary treatment is, but you know, it's through aeration and other using microbes to treat and denitrify the water where it comes off as gas essentially at the end. Um, but there's a cost, you know, and that's just the truth of the matter is there's a cost to running wastewater treatment plants um, and there's a cost to redu reducing nitrogen. And so, and it's a requirement. So through the um, National Pollution Discharge Elimination System of the Clean Water Act, wastewater treatment plants have thresholds and, and, you know, Connecticut Deep is, is the responsible party for EPA in this case, they're the second level that oversees those permits and makes sure that those limits are being met. And when they're not, it's called an exceedance, it's a violation. Get too many of those and, you know, you're in pretty hot water. Um, but yes, I mean, the short, short answer of it is nitrogen is removed. And there was a time where it wasn't. And thank goodness, thank God it is now. <laughs> because without it, we'd be uh, in a very eutrophic sound, especially as more and more people populate the area. And, and the, um, the level is set by 
by wastewater treatment plant. There's a TMDL for so our, there's a TMDL for the entire or? yeah total no Arbor. for the whole Long Island Sound. Uh, and so some wastewater treatment plants are closer to the shore, even if they're not. Their treated effluent goes out of the harbor that they may be in. But there's a handful. I don't know exactly how many. But like I said, Norwalk, Stamford, uh, Bridgeport, Blackrock. You know, the, they have these effluent that constantly are churning up treated effluent that does have nitrogen in it, even though it's treated. It's treated to a level, total nitrogen, say level, that meets the requirements of the open Long Island Sound TMDL. So it's in compliance, right? But we know, and you all know, that the deep waters of the open sound, that's a very different ecosystem. Very, you, you know, you're not seeing some of those organisms, that, for example, that Joe and Dick were talking about, you know, necessarily out there. It's it's different, right? So there's going to be probably some consideration as to the total maximum daily loads of nitrogen from point sources like wastewater treatment plants, but also from non-point sources that are entering our Connecticut embayments. And it's happening in New York as well through the Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan. It's not just Connecticut. Um, so those those could be coming. And I, I, I do think it'll be important for municipalities to get, you know, involved early. So there's no surprises and, you know, there's costs and there could be planning and the economics of it. And comments from groups like yours on the potential new nitrogen limits that are set. I'm sure other groups in Norwalk will be commenting as well, and we will. Okay, thanks. I'm hey. sorry. Okay, Peter, I have a, a couple of sorry, questions. 650. Um, one is USGS. Yeah. They have been doing 24 hour sampling seven days a week for most of the year. And they've been doing it now for two years. Their data has not been used. Now, I find that interesting, especially the last two years, because the runoff the last two years has been very, very low. Right. We've had drought. Mm -hmm. So we can't blame the hot water conditions on runoff. No, I wouldn't go that far, but I see that we've had less rain, you know, less precipitation. <laughs> um, so 2021, though, is where these grades that we're talking about are based. Right. So just to get to the first part of your, your question, the reason we don't include the USGS continuous monitoring data would be um, to what I was mentioning before, where we're looking for direct comparability. We have stations that were selected, stations that are monitored the same way from bay to bay. So, you know, there could be USGS isn't only in Norwalk and, and there's other groups, you know, that are doing monitoring in different ways. And, and continuous monitoring is very valuable, Joe. Um, as you well know, because I know you oversaw a good chunk of it for the Maritime Aquarium for years. Um, my thought on that is that that one station is in no way representative of the entire Inner Norwalk Harbor, which I don't think you're implying it is. But when you have four stations of monitoring, they're getting the same exact procedural, you know, monitoring as four stations in an adjacent harbor. That gives us the direct comparability. Pulling in data from USGS would be an interesting look but it, it gets away from you know we have a full white paper describing the grading process that we stick to and it's a big process it's not an overnight thing i mean it takes a long time to provide grades for 45 bay embayments 50 what 54 soon to be bay segment grades it's a lot of processing and data crunching and if we just introduced different sources from different harbors and kind of went as valuable as that information will be it really makes the grading process a little wonky um, it gets away from having a set, you know, you were a teacher, I believe, it gets away from having a set grading metric and starts introducing lots of, well, let's pull this from here because it's there and let's pull that from there, where we develop the program and the monitoring program specifically to have the data density we required for grading. And we as a collective group, I remember you, you had your chops and licks in there too. I remember meeting with you a few times and you gave some really important insight to that process. And by no means is the grading process only save the sound. We had a full advisory committee for developing it. But what I was talking about with Joe is the procedural work, like how we go about collecting the data was also a you know, multiple, multiple year process on just getting the procedures set before I, the monitoring even occurred. Peter, I'm, I'm well aware of that. But when you have another outside source for data and it's not being used for evaluation, you have to start to question why it's not being used. Hmm. Well, but, I, that's it, why it's not being used. It's not a, we're excluding that because of this. We're excluding it because it's not, the, it's just not collected the same way as all the other 40 plus embayments are having data collected. 
it just doesn't just we did we're not just jamming it in that's why it's not but, but it's at not the putting same, blinders on it or anything. at the same time it doesn't mean it's invalid as well as no it's not invalid, invalid at all the usgs does some wonderful pro morrissey and that crew they're doing a fantastic job and yeah. that those data go to the water quality exchange and they go to connecticut department of energy and environmental protection for their assessment purposes yep. so beyond the report card they are getting used for uh assessing norwalk's water quality um, we we are looking just to get to also uh, what you were saying in future report cards where there's tier two monitoring, which includes continuous dissolved oxygen monitoring 15 minute intervals for six months. We are looking at how we could bring that into the grading process as a secondary kind of information. So we don't want to create bias to the areas that have that, you know, you, you have a set program, you follow it, you have a set grading metric, you follow it. But we also have set procedures for how we collect continuous DO data. And that could be really informative as we move it around, especially to you know, have just extra data density and extra forecasting, I guess, in some ways, or especially for nutrients, you know, there'll, there'll be extra information that we'll build in. Well, nutrients and dissolved oxygen, because the one thing I found with dissolved oxygen was as soon as the sun came up, the oxygen level rose. Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, if you had a school of Menhaden or bunker that came into the area, it could crash. It can, especially and, in smaller corners. Of, uh, absolutely. But it, having one of those monitors at the aquarium, which USGS has, and they have one further up the river, and then they have another one at Perry Avenue, you yeah. can get an idea of what the oxygen levels are like coming down. But then you yeah. also have, have one out at Cove Marine. So you get an idea of what's coming in from the sound. Yeah. So you have a better idea of how temperature is affecting this, as well as oxygen, as well as sunlight. Mm -hmm. So you, you get to know why we're getting poor dissolved oxygen. And is it a, a result of what the city is or isn't doing, or is it natural? I'd say that the stressors that I demonstrated show that it's not 100% natural. Right. Oh, it's I not agree. natural to have 100 percent impervious coverage next to a river. It's not it's probably been channelized in so many places that it's not running its natural course. So it's it's a combination, Joe, of, of numerous factors. I think the challenges of being constricted and the challenges of having a large watershed and the challenges of flushing and such. Don't help inner Norwalk Harbor in regard to water quality whatsoever. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I agree. We got maybe Steve. Oh, oh and the U.S. Um, you, there, I didn't, the USGS, I think we, well, I provided you our thoughts on that one. And then, um, you know, we'll, we'll look at those data too. I mean, I encourage you all to, and we could even make comparisons. And like you said, there's that um, daily fluctuation with the sunlight and primary producers. And that's a reason that all the groups, speaking of which I know Dick run, like used to run a fantastic and maybe he's still out there. You know, he's collecting data, it's super valuable, but you know, he's not, like you're not getting up at 4.35 in the morning to get that information anymore. And you know, I don't think, I don't need to speak still, for you. He's still doing it, by the way. Yeah, you are, right. So so Dick's out there collecting those data, and that's really valuable. And one of the things we'd like to do is look at that, because our teams across the board, and they're not just my team, the Unified Water Study crews, all those data are collected three hours within sunrise. If they're not, they're disqualified and not included in the grading process. So we, as valuable as the information that can come in at 2, 3 p.m., some of the most eutrophic bays look like they're bubbling with oxygen at 2 o'clock. But then they're flatlining at midnight when that primary production turns to respiration, you get the dark side of photosynthesis, right? So, you know, that you get these big upswings. It's almost like the embayments are panting for life. So if we had, you know, say in East Chester Bay, we're out, but DEP is out at 2 p.m. at the same station, I'd expect wildly different results in terms of dissolved oxygen. And it would be very complicated to back calculate midday dissolved oxygen to what it could be at midnight without, say, continuous dissolved oxygen loggers to help with some formulation of a formula to make that work. Steve, you had a question? Yeah, thanks. I just uh, wanted to get it in quickly as the meeting's over time. Um, you mentioned that the three low DOs were what went into the calculation. I'm just curious if you've done any statistical analysis, perhaps to take then the next three lowest and then the next three lowest after that to see if it makes any difference. That's a really, that's a phenomenal question, Steve. So when we take three, it often is encompassing that window of hypoxia to a degree, but no, uh, the short answer is no, we've not looked at like, what would it be with the next three lowest or the next three lowest? 
um, we're covering that 25% of the data, like we're 25% of it, and we're looking for hypoxia, hence the lowest, right? And that's across the board, not just in Norwalk. Um, but that could be something if you'd like to undertake, or if you want to work with us to undertake it, you know, our time gets a little stretched, but we could look at something like that. I mean, the data is public, certainly, so I can get, I can put the data right in your hands for that type of analysis. Yeah, um, just, just wondering if uh, the, the result is essentially discussing potential it rather same. than actual. I would expect it, and I don't want to make assumptions to actually be quite probably different, um, but we could look at it. And especially as you go like three, three removed, you're probably starting to look at not necessarily the window that I was talking about for hypoxia, which is a natural, you know, there's a window that does form, as Joe's saying, you know, there's this natural functions at hand that we can't really right. control. And there, there may be some is, randomness associated with them. Yeah, that's a really, yeah, that's a good question. I Just breezing through the data, I tend not to see hypoxia outside of the June, July, August, like September and some of the more eutrophic systems might have a station or two, but um, we don't see it in May and October. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Peter, for coming. Great. Yeah. You're welcome, Joe. It's good to see you. Um, hope all is hey, well. It's good to be seen. Yeah. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. Happy to happy to meet again. And I will follow up on the things that I mentioned following up on. And, you know, let's not do this every two years. Um, more than happy to, you know, jump in and have more discussions um, as needed. Thank you very much for having me. Today. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye. Okay, reluctantly. Right. I, I, yeah, we're a little late. So if you want any of the last minute business, uh, maybe the minutes if you want. Other meeting I have to host, so I can't go too much longer. Correct. So uh, any comments or criticisms about the minutes from last meeting that were sent out? Everybody shaking their head no. So Bill, um, can I move to accept the minutes? All in favor? Okay, so the minutes are accepted. And can I have a motion to adjourn because of the next meeting that has to go on? Steve, second? Second. Okay, we will adjourn. Um, Tom sent out uh, a modified mayor's water quality committee recommendations, I will send it out to each of you. And if you can add your changes to that, we can uh, hopefully move on and get that done. Hopefully you all have a good night. Take care. You too. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Thanks, Joe.